South Africa's ruling ANC orders President Jacob Zuma to step down. On the road to success, we take you on a ride with African truckers in America. And how Nigeria is tackling the challenges of maternal and child mortality. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. Political stability in South Africa continues to be shaky. The nation's ruling party says it has decided to recall Jacob Zuma as the country's president, although there is no sign Zuma plans to comply with that decision. African National Congress Secretary General Ace Megashule made the announcement on Tuesday at a news conference. Zuma's tenure as president has been plagued by corruption allegations since he assumed the presidency in 2009. Zuma's current term is scheduled to end next year when South Africa holds general elections. An opposition coalition led by the Democratic Alliance and the far-left economic freedom fighters says it will demand parliament be dissolved and early elections held if Zuma leaves office early. Magashula says he expects the president to respond by Wednesday, though he emphasized the party has not given Zuma a deadline. We went uh, with the DSG today to meet with the president and communicate the decision of the NEC. So as we communicated this decision, obviously we are giving him time and space to respond. We haven't given him any deadline to, to respond. As to whether he's going to resign or not, I think we are saying, in terms of our constitution rule 12, we are actually saying after constructive discussions and the fact that the problem is about the short time, the shortening the time, which the NEC could not agree to, now, for more on this big announcement in South Africa, Anita Powell, viewer South and Africa correspondent, joins me live via Skype from Pretoria. Anita, uh, for many, they hear the news, uh, Jacob Zuma has been fired by ANC, but we know he's still president. What does that mean? Right. So, actually, uh, Jacob Zuma is still the president of South Africa, and that is because there's no legal obligation for him to resign just because his party, the ANC, has recalled him. So uh, this is a very interesting kind of uh, system of democracy. Uh, he, the party is going to wait for him to decide if he's going to resign. If he doesn't do so, what happens? So that's the million-dollar question. If he does not have a very clear answer for us, when we asked him this very question, he said they didn't give him a deadline. They had no plans to serve him with um, expulsion papers because, as, as you surely realize he's an ordinary member of the ANC as well. They could just expel him from the party, but that's not their intention, and they're not going to vote, they say, with the opposition to, uh, to give him a vote of no confidence, which would be an impeachment vote. So it's unclear what's going to happen next. Now, um, given that uh, a, a vote of no confidence is all about uh, the numbers in Parliament, if it doesn't go through, what does it mean? He continues being president until next election? That is a very interesting question, and that's, uh, I think, a fate that everybody, the opposition, the ANC, is seeking to avoid. Everybody except for Jacob Zuma. Um, you know, some, some scholars have said that would plunge this country into full-on constitutional crisis. Um, and so we're hoping that we never get to that day, I think. Uh, but if it were to happen, yes, he would continue to be president. Yeah, and uh, the opposition says if he leaves early, then they want the parliament to be dissolved and, the, and then elections called. Does ANC in any way feel uh, kind of uh, uncomfortable going to an early election? The ANC today called out the opposition for what they said were opportunistic moves. So it's obvious that they feel like this is maybe not their strongest moment. And they're right about that because Jacob Zuma's approval levels are really, really low, and by extension, the ANC's approval, uh, the approval ratings of the ANC will be a reflection of that. So the ANC does not want an election right now. It would not be a great time for them. They want to build their base and get more people on board, and they need about a year to do that, probably. 
Well, interesting days ahead of us. Anita, thank you very much for your reporting. Uh, that's uh, viewers Anita Powell reporting live via Skype from Pretoria. Now, for more perspective on the Zuma controversy, Tiniko Maluleke, a political analyst and professor at the University of Pretoria in South Africa, joins me by phone from Grand Rapids in Michigan. Good evening, Professor. Good evening. It's a pleasure talking to you and your viewers. Thank you. Now, please help us uh, kind of understand what's going on inside ANC because to many, uh, Jacob Zuma has been a survivor uh, for so many years. How is it that at this point, ANC has decided that he gets fired? I think it's a momentous decision uh, for the ANC to have come uh, to to this position where they, they are firing him and uh, to use their own words, they are recalling him. It's a big, big moment uh, for the ANC uh, because as you rightly point out, the same ANC has blocked every attempt that has been done by the opposition uh, to remove Jacob Zuma. The very same ANC has defended uh, Jacob Zuma uh, almost from day one when he started as, as, uh, as president, because you recall that uh, there were charges that were hanging over his head, there were allegations uh, and accusations of rape uh, of which he was accused. They have, they have stood by him for a long, long time. So this is a very important moment for them to, to, have, uh, to have come to. However, you will have heard at the press conference that the ANC seems to not be able to take the nation into its uh, uh, confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, it's unable to tell the nation what Jacob Zuma has done wrong, now, what, it, what it is that warrants him to be recalled. Yeah. But, but isn't it also uh, the case that uh, the ANC cannot make a case that it's just Jacob Zuma who has been a corrupt person here, that there are people within the ANC who are equally culpable? Yes. Well, it's not just people in the ANC. It is the entire ANC that is potentially culp culpable of the corruption that has been going on in the country, of protecting not only Jacob Zuma, but uh, also those who were working uh, with Jacob Zuma. So the ANC has an opportunity to come clean. In other words, to say we have done wrong, we have messed up. And one of the things we are doing now, the first things we are doing now to correct that is to fire Jacob Zuma. But this is not the end. We're going to cleanse ourselves. And the ANC isn't saying that. Wow. And maybe they, maybe they will say it, but they haven't said it yet. All right. We'll see. We'll wait and see if there will be a purge of some kind. Professor Maluleke, we do appreciate your insight. Thank you. Tiniko Maluleke is a political analyst and professor at University of Pretoria in South Africa. Now to East Africa, a top Kenyan official has resigned on Tuesday. President Uhuru Kenyatta announced without explanation that Attorney General Gidham Wigai had quit, adding that he had nominated a replacement. In a post on his Twitter feed, the president said he had accepted Mugai's resignation as Attorney General. In December, Mugai said an attempt by veteran opposition leader Raila Odinga to swear himself in as president would be regarded as treason. Now, the Kenyan government's respect for the law has come under scrutiny in the past two weeks after it declined to obey several court orders related to a crackdown on opposition figures who carried out the symbolic swearing-in of Odinga on January the 30th. Kenyatta and the judiciary clashed publicly last September after the Supreme Court nullified his initial election on August the 8th and ordered a repeat vote. Now, increasing demand for long-haul truckers in the United States is drawing more African immigrants onto America's roads. Reporter Azuma Kampauri hitched a ride with the African truckers whose routes to success stretch across the United States. It's a long road from Abidjan in the Ivory Coast to this interstate highway near Chicago. Trucker Mamudu Jawara releases the freedom and the paycheck. Trucking is the freedom. It's the freedom and, and the money is, is right. You know, I'm not going to lie to you. 
Yeah, you make more than like uh, the average Joe, you know what I'm saying? Diawara says truckers in the United States can make as much as $200,000 a year. The sometimes dangerous work involves long hours, but it's a chance to make a new life in a new country on his terms. You got to get the goods to the people. This is how the country is built. It doesn't matter where you were born. You can be whatever you want. This is, this is what this country teach me every day. Elias Belima took a similar journey from Burkina Faso. He saved for years to buy his truck, and now not a day passes without someone offering him work. For people like me who did not go far in the school system, it is an opportunity for us. It is tiresome, but after the labor, the result is good. After several days on the road, stuck inside a five-meter compartment, it's the little things that count, like a free shower. You got a towel free, you got a shoe free, and you got the water free. <laughs> After a long day's drive, it's time to sleep. But time is money and Balima is up early. And on this morning, he's thinking of home. I'm almost 34 years old now. I'm still not married, you see? Why are you not married? Well, my mind is between Africa and America. Sometimes I see younger brothers newly arrived from Africa telling me I will not stay more than two years in the state. My brother, you have never had some at McDonald's, right? As much as Balima and Jawara have grown to love French fries and the opportunities and freedoms in America, they know that in the current political climate, many Americans will always see them as Africans. Balima says he tries to stay out of the U.S. immigration debate. I know they are all politicians. I'm not afraid of him. If Americans did not like Trump, he would not be where he is today. But there's no room today for politics inside Balima's cab. For these African immigrants turned American truckers, keeping their eyes on the road is the key to success. Arzuma Kompoure for VOA News on the road in Illinois. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We are also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Now coming up, Nigeria's fight against maternal and child mortality. We'll be right back. How do you see the world? I see countries in turmoil. I see our planet changing. I see people at peace. No matter how you see the world, you'll get an unbiased and uncensored view of it on Voice of America, on television, radio, online, and mobile. In more than 40 languages all day, every day, millions of people tune us in. How do I see the world? On Voice of America. Well, it's time now for our health report, and joining us now is Africa 54 Health correspondent Lino Madu uh, to talk about maternal and child health. She also has a very special guest, Lino. That's right, Vincent. Well, every day about 800 women die from preventable causes related to pregnancy and childbirth. The World Health Organization says almost all these deaths occur in low-income settings as a result of conditions that include severe bleeding, infection, high blood pressure, and complications during delivery. Medical experts say maternal health is closely linked to newborn survival. According to UNICEF, while great strides have been made in reducing global child mortality since 1990. Each year, 2.9 million newborns needlessly die within the first month and an additional 2.6 million are stillborn. The main causes are complications due to prematurity, complications during delivery and infection. These causes are often preventable and treatable. 
and health experts say poor maternal and child health indicators have been reported in Nigeria since the 1990s. According to UNICEF, Nigeria is one of the largest contributors to the end of five and maternal mortality rate in the world. Joining us now in the studio for more is Dr. Isaac Adewole, the Nigerian Minister of Health. Dr. Adewole, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to have you. Listen, this is a really disturbing statistic. According to the United Nations, every single day, Nigeria loses 2,300 children under the age of five and about 145 women of a childbearing age die. What is your reaction to this as the Minister of Health? M my reaction is that the, the assertion is true, but there is an opportunity. The current administration in Nigeria is, is quite committed to turning the tide around. And uh, we've taken uh, quite a number of actions mm -hmm. that will really um, take Nigeria out of this league of shame nations where uh, we have maternal mortality and under five and newborn and uh, infant mortality rates that are outrageous. So before we talk about the actions that your government is are taking uh, to, to address this issue, let, help us to understand what is the biggest uh, challenge you face in keeping mothers and babies safe. Well, the, the first challenge is um, the fact that many mothers deliver out of facilities um, due to quite a number of reasons. Uh, the first is a lack of awareness mm -hmm. about the value of uh, delivering in facilities, poverty, uh, as well as illiteracy. And, and we also have challenges with respect to the north-south divide, the poor-rich divide, and the urban-rural divide. And when you look at the indicators in Nigeria, the, 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 the health indicators for the rich, for the educated, it, it's not too different from what you have in the United States of America and Europe. But for the poor, it, it is worrisome. So the solution then, or one of the main solutions, will be addressing poverty? Oh, certainly, to, okay. to, to address poverty. And that's why under the current government, we have one of the most robust social intervention program in the history of Nigeria. Which is? Which, which is to offer support, conditional cash transfer to poor people, offer employment to, to, to people who are unemployed, and also improving on get child education. And what type of impact have you seen so far? Well, it, it's too early to talk about impact because okay. um, for you to measure impact, you want, you, you want to think about two, th two three, four, five years. Uh, but, but we are quite convinced that uh, over the next couple of um, uh, years, uh, we, we will make a big dent. Now, there are some uh, experts who say that uh, one of the issues is the fact that there are still many women who give birth at home. So how is this being addressed? If we look at the, the issue of midwives, because many, many times midwives are the one, they are the very first one to be at the forefront, whether the mother is pregnant or when she's giving birth or after even giving birth. So what is being done on that front? Well, the first is to make sure that we have midwives available. We are establishing and restoring accreditation to many schools of midwifery, particularly in the northern states. We have what we call a midwifery service scheme where we are employing midwives either retired or unemployed in some of these critical areas. The other is a new initiative that was launched by Mr. President uh, precisely one week ago. We call it the Community Health Intervention and Provider Scheme, where young people uh, are employed, trained, to serve as interlink between the community and the facility. The, the, the real uh, goal is to make sure that we improve health seeking behavior and move people away from our homes into facilities. Now, one of the issues as well is about trust in the health system. And, uh, and another, another issue is the fact is access. So there are women who live far from the health centers. Other women say when they go to the hospital, they do not receive the care that they need. Perhaps there are not enough health workers or they do not really have the trust in the system that they need to have. So how do we address trust in the health system when the health system may be broken? Well, the, the first thing we are doing is to really um, reorganize the architecture of the health system in Nigeria. We are putting emphasis on primary care as a platform and the foundation 
for a reinvigorated healthcare system in Nigeria. Uh, much more importantly is we are also putting resources um, in this facility. We are also kickstarting uh, the concept of the um, basic care, care provision scheme where we will offer basic care to poor people, particularly in rural areas, in three of our states uh, uh, by the end of March next, this year. And this will be the beginning. We intend to roll this across the country. But empathy is another thing where we also want to teach. We're trying to build a um, level of awareness, educate our health caregivers that they need to build trust. When you close the gap between the provider and the client, uh, through trust, through offering patient-centered, compassionate care, then people will trust us better and come to the facilities. Professor Adewole, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. And that was uh, Dr. Isaac Adewole. He is a Nigerian Minister of Health. It was our pleasure to have him today. And that's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter at Lino Hmudu. Back to you, Vincent. Well, thanks a lot, Lino. I'll be sure to watch Lino Madu's health reports uh, every Tuesday and Thursday right here on Africa 54. Well, the invention of a machine that removes pumpkin seeds from the shell and sorts them is being celebrated in Cameroon as traders hope to boost production of the commodity in the Central African country. Here's viewers correspondent Maria Madiello. For these two traders who've been selling pumpkin seeds, peeling them can be time consuming. It's very difficult to peel because you can peel a five liter bucket in four days, but when you have nothing to do, you can peel it in two days. It's very difficult. It's a big job doing that. It's not easy for us to get peeled seeds. Now their prayers have been answered. A machine that can not only remove seeds from their shell, but also sort them. The Cameroonian inventor says at first, the idea was to make a simple machine that could peel. But as I got into the process, I realized that it was much more complicated than that, and that's why it didn't yet exist. So I changed the approach to a chain approach where every element does a given job. You must have seen, for example, the peeling machine that peels, but then there's a sorting machine that sorts. Basically, he says, in one day, his factory can produce what would take six months for people to do. Someone who peels the seed by hand to produce one kilogram of pumpkin kernels takes one day without the machine. With it, we produce 100 kilograms per day and we can do more. It's a life changing process, a professor says. It's first and foremost an income generating activity. In the long run, of course, it will seriously boost production. Oil remains Cameroon's main export commodity, but the government, which has held power since 1982, has taken recommendations from the IMF and the World Bank since the 1990s to embrace programs designed to increase efficiency in agriculture and improve trade. Maria Madialo, VOA News. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54 how drones are delivering supplies to places few can reach. We'll be right back. to Africa 54 and here's what's trending. Now over 30 African designers recently unveiled their latest collections at the South African Menswear Week in Cape Town. 
Johannesburg-based designer now Sirate, who's known for his fearless unisex creations. The Target Young People was one of the highlights. His collection incorporated mesh, synthetic materials, and other fabrics to bring out his unconventional pieces done in bold colors. Up and comer Atin Kosi Mfungula showcased pieces from his brand, Lemfax, which he says takes cues from military uniforms. His collection included long coats, sleeveless shirts, hats, and waistcoats. Uh, this year's edition also included workshops and mentorship programs, giving young and well-known designers a chance to exchange ideas. Well, and finally, farming in Kenya is widely seen as an occupation for the elderly living in rural areas, as younger people desert rural communities for life in the city. Now, a reality show is trying to prove to young people that farming is cool, fun, and profitable. Don't Lose the Plot is the first reality television show in Africa to focus on farming. The contestants are four young farmers from Tanzania and Kenya. They farm and live together, each working on a one-acre plot. The winner has to demonstrate that they are able to turn their plot into a viable farm. The farmer with the highest yields and profits gets to take home a cash prize of about $10,000. That's according to uh, show producer Patricia Githinga. The ultimate goal is to change perceptions about farming. And that's what's trending today. Now, it's been called a delivery drone, an unmanned area vehicle, or even a glider. It can be used to deliver essential supplies to areas traditional uh, shipping and delivery companies cannot go. Viewers Elizabeth Lee has more from Los Angeles. This lightweight device could make a difference between life and death. So many times we found that during times of crisis or humanitarian need, it's very, very difficult to get supplies into remote regions. Couple that with um, reduced or uh, destroyed infrastructure, uh, th those are the um, areas and the circumstances under which this system really shines. The system's aim is targeted delivery. You can always fly an airplane overhead, so we help bridge that gap. We're using our technology, you can throw a package out of an airplane and have it land right at the area of use. There's a built-in global positioning guidance system that provides enough accuracy to land the vehicle in the courtyard of a hospital. This DASH systems delivery drone will go to places other services don't. So, for instance, a delivery in South Sudan or Puerto Rico, uh, oftentimes every traditional carrier will say no. Organizations are willing to pay the fair market value for those trips. They just do not have a solution. Joel Eiffel thought of this solution while working on smart bombs in a previous job. Actually, I felt bad about essentially making technology that was designed to harm and kill people. So I was uh, wondered what else could I do with the technology of, of a smart bomb, something that can launch from an airplane and land within inches. And I thought, why can't I use that same technology to deliver packages and goods? Made of low-cost styrofoam, plywood, and plastic, there is no worry about getting it back after making a delivery. It can hold up to 20 kilograms of food, medicines, and supplies to people who are most in need anywhere in the world. Elizabeth Lee, VOA News, Los Angeles. Well, that's our show. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. Welcome to English in a Minute. This expression sounds like a violent way of eating, but it's actually not always about eating. Here is your Russian book, Anna. Thanks for letting me borrow it. Oh, are you done with level one already? Yeah, I finished last week. And I've already finished level two. Wow, you are really sinking your teeth into learning Russian. Well, 